And I'm now delighted to invite uh, our speakers uh, for the panel. To you, after uh, listening to Moss and to Saskia and Stefano, who have expressed great interest in examining the urban as a special condition for precipitating change in society. So I was kind of wondering if you could speak uh, a little bit more about the difference in your approach to working in a structure in, in Gando, in a rural area, versus actually an urban context, like the parliament you're building in Ouagadougou or the pavilion you're building here. And to phrase the question, I'm going to quote uh, Mawson, who actually phrased it better than I can, because he wrote on an exquisite corpse we did before over coffee, the following contradictory question. Is it possible to speak of the urban and the rural simultaneously? <coughs> wow. <laughs> no, I forget. I'm sorry. I forget to, to say. Uh, Welcome to all of you, and thank you for coming. I mean, uh, I was very nervous, so, um, so and then uh, Melissa, uh, Ecom, um, John from Ecom, Ted from um, Stage One. Uh, I mean, if, if we didn't have all of these people, uh, this would not be uh, possible. Um, and I have to invite you to come and, and, and enjoy the radical kitchen that will happen here. Uh, it's going to be amazing. You have f women from different nationalities that put them together and say, let's cook the world. And the women are, you know, uh, so fundamental to my work in Burkina Faso. That's why it's important for me to underline it. If you see how the women help to make a, a, a clay floor, floor in my home, you will be, they, they will blow you all. It's like a dancing. It's a, a session of music. Here we couldn't do uh, clay, but concrete sometimes is good too. So. Um, um, so you should keep coming and uh, checking what you're doing. If it's possible to talk about rural or the design, you want to know what is the difference working in the rural zone and the public, and then what is different with my little structure in, in Gando and to the, uh, to the vision we have for Ouagadougou. <clears throat> Very simple. I think that we have a good training. We architect, and a good training is to give you a tool to be able to use it in a village, uh, in the city and to design a, a little furniture and not doing publicity for myself but you sitting you sitting on 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 on, on, on element in uh, uh, that I did and I even designed this with Nina Tescari sitting here um, it was an idea I had to I was doing the um, um, uh, the design week in Milan and the part two the part two they wanted to have object from me I said designing a furniture is a very delicate thing I have no interest to do that always saying to her tell them I'm not interested in doing a furniture um, and they keep asking and one day I was coming I was in Gando I get the, the, the question again I was say give to a designer just contact a nice guy and get some furniture for these people I don't want to do uh, and Nina called me very subtle. If 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 she, the English we use it in the office, if it's not easy to convince me through English, she turned to French. Uh, she's Italian, educated in France. Mais Francis, je crois que ce serait bien si tu réfléchissais à quelque chose. So she couldn't give up. And I was in Gando. I look at to the hawker, a sitting of my mother in Gando. I say, okay, this is our hawker. I took it to Berlin. And I made it like a little bigger, you know? So, you know? And that was it. And Riva 1920 says, I asked him very shy, why did you decide to do this furniture? You know, I look at your design, it was so nice, so elegant, and I knew there will be a big market for it. I said, really? So, I want to say the design, we're learning something to be able to deal in both parts, urban and rural. And sometimes, Sometimes things that you see in the rural will serve the, 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 the urban. Um, um, and it is important. Um, so I am I'm nervous and, and overwhelmed. I have like a hero uh, here. I have like a, um, a mentor. 
and I have like a, a, a Farouk that has been a mentor to me several years, coaching me. He's the, the chair of the, the head of Aga Khan Award. Um, so I'm really nervous, and if I am, I, I'm, I'm telling blah blah blah, you know. So, <laughs> not to say uh, the, in Burkina Faso, the, the rural is fitting the urban. The cities are growing, food is coming from the village. So if you see how the structure in Ouagadougou is growing, it's totally horizontal, totally horizontal. Can, can, can yes. we intervene? Of or, that's or, or yes, 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 that is the key. Okay, so, so I have two questions. Yes. One is probably silly. Yeah. I want to know why that roof goes down. Yeah. Now, Very I simple. can imagine collecting water, but yes. then you need a base. Yes. Is that what it is? You have it. Okay. You have a hide it. It's London. Then my second question. <laughs> Urban, the urban-rural uh, issue. So it seems to me that what I was saying about the tree, that we need the tree, we need these spaces. Yeah. In, in our big cities especially, yeah. we don't, almost don't need them in the rural areas. Yeah. We need them in our cities. And so is this space for you marked by rurality? Because for me it is not necessarily, you know what I mean? This is a space that we need in all our cities. A space where we can restore ourselves, yeah. and also as a as a as a sort of a zone of combat yeah. against the privatizing of so much space that may look public but is actually private. So, h how do you can you sort of elaborate a bit on that? Yes. Or? In the rural zone in Burkina Faso, you don't need a, to build this; it is there. You have to plant it really. Right. Um, but here, I was thinking, uh, let's just. Uh, it is, a, it is an inspiration of a figure of the street in the landscape. It's not a real street. But I wanted to create, you know, I see people going in park and rushing over. I wanted to create a shorter en enclosure to invite people yeah. to just camp and to camp together and meet. Right. And it's like not just jogging for yourself, bam, 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 like they do, they will go back to their apartment. Exactly. I wanted to create right. a, a space that, is, that costs nothing and it is there, provide shade and even an enclosure to get people cam and meet each other right. for free. Yeah. And it is about indeterminacy, right? Yes. This is meant to be indeterminate rather than overdetermined, where everything has a function. And that is another issue that for me is very important. Mm -hmm. That that we we are losing indeterminacy. You know, everything is over designed, over marked. Mm -hmm over-established, over-regulated perhaps too, though we need a bit more of that in London perhaps, but on the fire, I'm thinking the fire. I have a team. But is this for you a bit <laughs> indeterminate or not? No. It's indeterminate, is uh, some thing are, uh, are meant to just create the enclosure, but I wanted the visitor to be free how to use it, and even I, we. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's important not to uh, overemphasize indeterminacy. indeterminacy? Mm. Because, I mean, uh, Francis did mention that he doesn't need this in Burkino, but actually I think in Burkino you have also designed this. Yes. Because in Burkino, I mean, one of the things, for example, about the school is that you provide a shelter, which yes. is outdoor, where people can sit and are protected from the shade. Yes. So in some ways, in front of the school, there's also a tree where people can sit under the tree and, and congregate the same way that they can in this class between the classrooms okay. in the building so i think that the space of protection the space of shelter is something that is probably important in terms of the symbolism of the tree as a place of gathering as a place for discourse as a place for conversation and i think related to your you know point about the the, the, the cities in some ways i mean i think private i mean i think that, that uh, many years ago we used to live in Philadelphia, and in the center of Philadelphia, there is a very beautiful park called Rittenhouse Square. And many people have written about this square because this is located very much between sort of north and south of the city and brings people from very diverse backgrounds to this place and is, is very much a kind of protective space. And actually, they're. they're, they're you know, that is indeterminate. It, For me, that yes, is but it's, it's not in. I mean, it's a very defined space that, that has the possibility of informal uses. So, I mean, mm. if this space didn't have the walls that define it to some degree, if it didn't have the, the, the canopy to protect it, of course it's open, but it's not also that it's that is pure, totally indeterminate. So, and that's what I was going to say. Maybe I use indeterminate a bit different. No. 
In other words, that it's less controlled, that it yes, is sorry. made yeah. by the practices that yes. happen. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I'm sense. thinking of, uh, I'm doing this project in Paris, uh, five-year project on all the violence, the alienations. And so one question for me to avoid talking about alienated youth in the banlieue, I say the importance of indeterminate space in our cities so that those who feel only marginally connected to the city, in this mm -hmm. case many of the youth in the banlieue, can say, you know what, this is also my city. Sure. Whereas the Jardin de Luxembourg, they would say, you know what, it may be public, it's not my space. And so mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think of the tree, and that is why I think we need it more than you need it, uh, you know, in, 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 in Africa maybe, I don't know, in Burkina Faso. But we really need it. We need these spaces that are designed in such a way that indeterminacy works. So it's not about zero, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because, you know, it connects to what I referred to before with, you know, René Gaiuste and these whole, you know, housing projects in, in Ivry. Uh, Niklas Mark urged me to go and, and make that visit, you know, and I think it leads to a, a next question. It's again a question Mawson wrote down, which is, you know, if the, sh if the height of the urban area should be limited, and, you know, the question of cause is, you know, should uh, should we go vertical? Right. Or because you know, Francis talked about horizontality a lot. You mm -hmm. know, should our solutions vertical or horizontal? Because of course, um, you know, what Guy Eustace and Renaudi did are not are not towers. Yet Stefano, you built actually a vertical building where you combined in a way the city Absolutely. and the, the exactly. countryside. So maybe yeah. it's good if you tell us a little bit more yeah. about that, and then we can come back to Mawson's question. No. Well, yeah. Um, tomorrow I will be part of. Um, a meeting organized by the Commonwealth. And uh, uh, it's really amazing how Commonwealth is now trying to launch a campaign to reverse climate change, uh, gathering all the 52 countries, one third of the population of the world, to push the direction of uh, regenerative development to reverse climate change. And one of the main issues, and I will be there for the reason, is how to intervene in uh, cities, because cities, well, you know, it's, uh, and how we can imagine to develop a kind of holistic approach to the issue of uh, sustainability, uh, trying to put together the necessity of densification, Right. And now I come immediately to your question. And at the same time, the opportunity to, there's a problem with the microphone. The necessity of densification and the opportunity to, uh, to realize an urban environment who is done by the variety of cultures, the variety of uh, uh, individual trajectories. So this kind of combination that we could call intensity, which is done by the density of spaces and the variety of culture, is exactly what uh, I think uh, we more or less to uh, follow as a direction, as a star in our, in our work. And uh, why we cannot simply say vertical buildings cannot work or because verticality in itself will become a necessity. Yeah. Will become a necessity more and more. Because uh, 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 to build vertical, it reduces the cost. To build vertical, avoid us to consume agricultural field, natural field. It can develop uh, this idea of intensity, but for sure, uh, what we have to drastically abandon is a way to be vertical, which vertical buildings are uh, monolithic in terms of social behaviors. They are they like a homogeneity. So I, I think that uh, we have to work a lot in that field. And Saskia, you wrote before over coffee, if the tower is Keres tree, we are fine, aside for recovery. If the tower is not Keres tree, um, not fine. <laughs> not fine. <laughs> 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 right. Oh, we are talking from this mic. Well, I mean, the tree could be a tower. And the point, of course, is that you don't want it to be that. But verticality as such, you know, 
And same thing with horizontality. Some horizontal, the suburbs of North America are a disaster, right, in terms of the environment and sociability. So it, 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 there is, that comes back to me about this indeterminacy as not as an either or, but as an intermediate zone. You know, how do you not overdefine it? So that, and talking about, you know, what you were just saying, I remember when I was at, in Chicago, they have these huge buildings, you know, that are all landmark, I mean, office buildings. You know, the first high-rise buildings, I think, were made in Chicago or something like that. And, but they were no longer useful for office use. They were such, such large footprints, every floor, that neither could you use them well as a traditional notion of an apartment building. What did they do? They created the tree inside every floor, a central space that you could not make part of the living space, mm -hmm. but that could be space for the kindergarten function, that could be space for people to hang out, for people to do parties, you know, so every floor. So th these are the, this is what also what I mean a bit by the indeterminacy, that a building actually enables, and I think we're going to have to move in that direction. I think that many of our buildings are not fully, we don't need the access that they represent, or we don't need the constraints that they represent. But I think, you know, part, part of the... Part of the issue is when you talk about a tree, is, as, as I think has been said, is not to think about it literally, no, and not to think about it literally as a tree or a building right. looking like a tree or things like that. Oh. I mean, part of the, the importance of the tree is what the tree provides, for example, right. is the shade or the space of gathering and this kind of thing. So to complement your idea of indeterminacy, I also like what the, the American sociologist, I guess, Elijah Anderson, has called this concept of the cosmopolitan canopy, the notion of a canopy as a space of, of gathering, a space of discourse. So I think, you know, going back to the question of the height, it's not so much that you shouldn't build tall buildings or you shouldn't build towers. The, the fact is that towers are being built throughout the world precisely because the power structures, the financial organization of of building sites is orchestrated according to the to the sale of lots, which in many 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 places result in the in the construction of individual buildings. So at the moment we don't really have a situation where people are necessarily designing cities as as an ensemble together at the same time as buildings. So that's one of the issues that I think we have to face is how do you integrate, in a sense, planning, urban design, and the building of individual buildings as part of a sort of total ensemble. And who's to do that? Um, since the state, cities in many places, they don't have the resources to do that. We're then caught in a very, very difficult spot, precisely because then it reinforces the idea of the tower block or the individual block as the primary way in which urban design is constructed around the globe. And that, I mean, that's, that's one of the issues. It's actually a kind of financial, political kind of issue that we are, we're facing. But do there could be fantastic towers. Do, do, do you think that the environmental question, you know, if we begin to take seriously the environmental question, I think some transversal logics come into the picture and they create a new normality, which for us, to a very large extent today, it still looks like abnormal, you know, to us, those who don't know very much, to us, those who don't have time to think about it. But I do think that if we take that environmental vector seriously and what it all means, so one image for me is every surface of a building is both the, the wall or whatever, but it also needs to work with the environment. And then you have to, if you look at what biologists are discovering, what material science people, you know, every building has to contribute to the greening of its own immediately surrounding space, you know, air-wise, you know, concrete, we know that we can do that with concrete. You know, when you begin to trot in other logics, then some of these notions that we have had for so long about how do we build in a city, they begin to look less, less commanding. You know, you say, well, you know, we could also do it very differently. Um, yeah. And that leads us. Um, that's that, Brock? Yeah. That leads us to um, 
Francis, to your big project, which is the government building, which of yeah. course, um, in, in Burkina Faso, which of course, in a way, is bringing in a very ecological notion into a big building. Can you tell us a little bit about the vision of that building? No, it's, uh, it's again, I mean, um, in, in life you cannot choose the project that are coming to you. You can decide to <laughs> deal with it or not. Um, here is Francis running with his office trying to find a way to do his little project and then there was a revolution and uh, the parliament house was burned down and uh, you get a call, oh, you have to join the group of think and intellectual to design a new parliament building. So what do you do? You say no, oh, it's Africa, you have to know we are connected. You say no, oh, he's famous, what, famous? He's famous and he don't want to invest himself for his country. So. Um, you go, you know, if you have a good idea, there will be no money to do it. So what do you do? Um, I just joined them and I tried to create an utopia, hoping that I will let me go. Um, so we designed a big, big gathering space. Uh, born of my experience, if you are in this big city, uh, uh, which is growing very, very fast, there is no, no public space during the day to stay. <laughs> And uh, another idea was they wanted to create a transparent building, um, democratic, like open, and to, to think about how to connect the people with it. I said, okay, let's build a big pyramid so that everyone can come and climb on the top of the building at any time during the day if they do a, a, a celebration that could take pictures. Um, this one, is one element, but also to just um, to, to, to change the perspective of the people. So you have to know that in Burkina, uh, not all the people has climbed higher than 16 meters, which, uh, which is very high for a tree. Uh, so not many of them have taken an aircraft. And they don't see this horizontal growth. Um, and for me, I was connecting things that have been uh, occupying me uh, together to just compile to an idea and hoping they will say, okay, we don't do that. But then, to my surprise, everyone, everyone is over, over excited. Uh, Nina will, uh, will say here, uh, I'm try I tried since weeks, since months, to pull back and run away, but there is no way. Um, there is, they love this vision, they love the uh, transparent house, they love it because I told them, you know, if you let people climb on the top, you know, they will not burn it by the next revolution, which for sure, for sure, we can, because we, we, did, we didn't take seriously the challenges that a growing city are causing. You have a number, a huge number of young people that has no job, yeah. no job. Torture. And not all of them can buy a ticket to come to your place here. Lucky you, lucky you. But if they don't solve it, the next revolution will come. Yeah. It will come, Sean. But if we build my parliament house, our parliament house, they will not burn it down. <laughs> that will protect it because it's the public space. That's how I think, that's how I am. And that is the idea with the Parliament House. But, by the way, let me add a little bit um, something here. Of course, the inspiration is a tree. But isn't this engineering? Isn't it not architecture? Look at this big span. In Gando, I would not be able to do it alone. But in London, I had like amazing engineering company that put the finger to get this happen. I wanted to challenge the idea that I have been putting together in Gando to get it work. And the water can be collected. Um, it is, we can collect 9,000 liter. I have uh, Amy. So how much liter? Yes, this is the center. The drainage is capable to collect 9,000 because they had to limit it. You could do even more, really. It's like, like not that symbolic. We have to do it. We, I mean, we have to, we have to keep being credible. Yeah. That is it. But you know, what you are doing here is embedding multiple forms of knowledge and functionalities, like the water. But you know, it's absolutely, yeah. And I do encourage you all to come here urgently when it rains. <laughs> <laughs> because it was it's actually you know, one of the first time ever I, I hope for rain. 
because uh, in the park because it did rain for a few minutes the other day and you can see it on the Serpentine Instagram we made a little film and it's absolutely magical because there is a cascade there is a very very beautiful sound a very beautiful sound and there is a cascade and there are incredible indescribable light effects which happen when the light and the rain come together in this oculus it's uh, it's truly amazing now Francis I have, I have a couple of more questions I wanted to ask you one question which I always ask which is you know we are celebrating here your amazing pavilion but I was wondering if you have any unrealized projects, dreams, utopias. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, I mean, knowing that we had a big, big catastrophe with the tower, it's delicate to say what I'm saying, but I will say it. If I have a, I still have a lot of projects in Africa that are going. Um, it is really good. Um, we building not just in, Buki, in Gando. The project in Gando are not finished. Don't think it's a finished master plan that you're gonna go and see. No, it is it's still a process and even I have less time for my people uh, just to keep pushing the project. But if I have something that I will, I'm able to do, I will, I will build with a group of people a tower in London and another one in Wagadougou. So they will talk to each other and you will see that we are connected in Burkina or here. The effort is just to create great space for people and I have, I'm lucky to be able to demonstrate a little one, fluid, fluid, but working, well ventilated, open. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. It's an idea. Yeah, an amazing idea. Now, I wanted to come to Mosin's uh, book because we mentioned that we would, you know, talk about the ethics of the urban and um, in, in your book most you discuss the idea of spatial justice I was wondering if you can talk a little bit you know in connection also to Francis's work this idea that architecture and buildings are not socially engaged only but go beyond that that they can become agent of, of, of spatial justice I think I think that uh, Saskia has been sort of touching on this and discussing this um, uh, this evening, um, but I think you know a lot of the times when, for example, we discuss democracy and human rights, and we see these as legal constructs, and we don't speak about them as spatial constructs. And I think for a long time, people have been thinking so much about, for example, what kind of housing do we have? What sort of public space do we have? What sort of institutions do we have? And many of these, these elements that surround us, they're, they're precisely the kinds of uh, spatial situations that really provide a framework for what we might call, or what, you know, what we might say, sort of democracy in action, because it's not just about our votes, but it's actually about the kind of quality and caliber of the spaces that we have and we, we inhabit. And in a sense, then, the role of the designer becomes quite critical, because what sort of spaces are you imagining in terms of housing? What sort of spaces are you imagining in terms of you know, public spaces? And so on and so forth. So the caliber and quality of those are not inseparable from really what they provide for us in terms of our quality of life, the kind of rights that we have, because they're, they're the ones that are providing the kind of context. So I think you know, with this book, one of the hopes is to really make a much closer connection between the spatial and the political, in a way. I think that that's something that a lot of the times architects are be you know, becoming more and more service providers, they wait to get commissions and so on and so forth, and in a way they don't engage systematically directly in thinking about ways in which they can design which is deeply rooted in the, in the political dimension of everyday life in, as citizens themselves. They're sort of like providing designs for, for a commission in, in a way. And I think this is why I was also referring to the participatory dimension in some ways of, of Gando and you working with the community because it's really deeply engaged with the, with the community. When we find that, you know, I mean, that Kensington and Chelsea um, which is not a poor borough, are saving money and they're giving like, you know, 100 pounds or something it is 
to the members of the community, but then they are saving on using a cladding, which is not kind of the, the right thing, maybe, I, who knows. But it just does seem to speak about kind of values in, in a sense. And so I think part of it is really this question of the spatial, it's like how, what sort of values do we have? Uh, we've had a situation where there's been you know, a lot of commitment to building social housing, to building cities for a much wider, you know, a diverse sort of population. And this is why the reference to the cosmopolitan canopy is important because precisely of that kind of diversity. And, and we are separating these things, whether it's in the States or here, there's such division, such polarization. And I think that, that in a way, architects, designers are like Francis is trying to, I mean, in a way, to engage much more directly with the political dimension and see a, a very direct link between public spaces, architecture, buildings, the formation of cities, and their character being necessary preconditions for democracy to act, to play. I mean, I think the analogy with the theater, with the setting, with the, with the scene of the, of the drama, in some ways, is much more direct. This is why I think the projects in, in, in Gando have been very much like a setting providing kind of the right set of or interesting varied set of actions for the kids, for the teachers, for the community to use the school not just only as an institution but also as a public space in a way. I think that that's one of the positive dimensions of the school and I think if we see architecture more in that sense I think it would get closer to becoming more deeply rooted in the, in the political dimension of things. So this, this book, I had forgotten that I contributed. It's, it's a great title, by the way. Uh, what is the title again? Actually, I know it's great, but I can't remember a bit so Ethics, that I can mention Ethics, it. Ethics, Ethics of, of the Urban. Yeah, the Ethics of the Urban. So I, and I had forgotten that I had written that article for you. I now, my new project is starts with a question. It's not ethics of the city, you said. What does the ethics in the city? Mm -hmm. The city, after all, by definition, is going to have inequalities, differences, there's no such thing as. And so, what is the meaning of ethics? When I look at all those beautiful texts about ethics, they're all so beautiful because they stay away mm -hmm. from the mess that is a city, given all the inequalities, all the injustice. And so I'm really now intrigued by what this could mean, you know? What does it mean to talk about ethics in the city? Because then you have to, Inequality is going to be there. And in that sense, when I mentioned in passing early, we need many trees. I don't mean literally trees. Eh? No, no. I meant it as spaces where we can make other kinds of tissues, eh? social tissues. Also maybe economic, but I'm especially... So, so I, I mean, to me, this is really on the agenda now for urbanists, and it is a totally different... It's a transversal, you know, entering into established forms of knowledge and all of that. So it's, it's quite exciting, actually. So and it's great to have that. And Stefano, I was actually wondering, what is your view on this idea? Do you think, is it possible to speak of the ethics uh, and the politics of the urban simultaneously? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think that politics has always to do with space. So every kind of public policies always produce effects which are material and they change the space, so it's the most abstract. The financial policies are, it's producing space, it's changing borders, it's creating new roofs. Uh, so, uh, in a way, the, the stupid answer is that uh, uh, we cannot, uh, let me say, completely separate these two fields. But uh, let me go back to this uh, uh, attempt to define the, public, the notion of public space, which is, I think, in a way here, it's really relevant. So we have used the word uh, reciprocity, Hans. Then we have introduced the word under, under the term indeterminacy. indeterminacy. I'd love to add two other uh, words. One is uh, unpredictability. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what makes a space real public, it's not its juridical condition or it's the fact that 
everything could happen. Absolutely everything. So a space which is so generous and open that everything. That's beautiful. So, and the other thing which for me is so important when I to design a public space, and this is another compliment to, to Francis, it's, uh, it's the notion of complicity. So uh, a space is public when it is capable to absorb the projection and the reaction that each one of us could develop. Uh, if a space is too much determinate, it's not, in a way, public, because it's obliged you to, uh, to accept one unique code. And uh, I, I think that uh, these two things together uh, are ways also to define this space. Reciprocity, indeterminacy, unpredictability, and complicity. And complicity. Francis, you want to say anything? Before we open it, Claude Agile every day talks about the, the, the Bamako National Park, you know, another project of yours, and we haven't spoken about that yet. Uh, so maybe we can somehow link it to that and find another world. <laughs> no, um, That's a good start, no. no. <laughs> yeah, the, the part, yeah. Um, the value is a public space is so high that you don't, even you cannot pay with money. You know, uh, a couple of years ago I had the chance to work with the Aga Khan Foundation, Aga Khan Network for Development, who was looking to create um, um, a green length, le poumon vert, green le poumon yes. uh, for the city. I think uh, it is it is the, the, the poumon of life. The park is so important, and then to, to get it free, to make it open to anyone was so great. And we did this park. This park is, has become amazing. It's attracting entire, the entire city, you know, the multiple million city. People are going, and people are fighting for it. I went one day to control, and I was seeing a very uh, a sort of conservative group of people trying to fight against young people that start to use it like uh, lay, lying down. And it's so everyone feel it for him. And that is the power of a public space. We should do more. And regarding what you said, uh, we need more trees. I mean, I'm ready. Yeah. Just keep, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, we're ready. Let's go. So, we're ready. Yeah. And then to maybe to the younger, younger audience, I have to say simply one thing. If you listen to this experience and uh, heal for us, the simple thing is they're all pushing us to go further out to the boundary or out out the boundary. I mean, if you have an idea, just fight it, <laughs> fight for it. Don't wait. If people try to turn you, you should not listen a little bit. But you know, you could let it go here in or let go here out. Mm. Follow your goal because later. Later, some people will discover what he was doing. When I was doing my project in Burkina, people didn't understand the need mm. why I was doing it. And I had one good teacher who says, you know, just do it. You don't know. You, don't, should, you should not consider it as a private task. It has the potential to contribute to architecture. I was looking to him again, another stupid German teacher that wanted to tell me what is important. I don't care. I want to do something for my village. But it brought me here. Go ahead. The world is yours. You don't have that network. You're free. Except if you're married, you have to be take, pay attention to your But just go. It will. Not, not, just we can change the world. The other are a network. The politician, they cannot. They can decide. But after two months, no, yes, they will go. But you are free. Really free. And you can have the chance to design for serpentine too. <laughs> yes. That could not be a better moment to open it uh, to your questions. I was actually thinking, uh, it's beautiful, this idea of the Poumont, no? the lung, uh, what Francis mentioned, because at the very beginning, day one, when we met and uh, Francis was starting to think about the pavilion here, he told us the structure has to be open, it's breathing, no? and I think we can all feel that sitting here today, the breathing, and in a way, it connects also uh, to the very first time we met with Francis, which was three years ago, in a conference about Cedric Price. And of course, 
the late Cedric Price, whom we must remember here, because I think <laughs> came to my mind also when Saskia spoke about indeterminacy. I mean, he is, of course, the ultimate architect of indeterminacy. Um, and Cedric's very <laughs> last project uh, was a very beautiful project for Manhattan, where lots of architects were invited to propose buildings. And he actually proposed to create an oxygen lung, a lung <laughs> for the city. Do we have questions from... We can take questions. We have a question here. Do we have a microphone for the gentleman? Yeah. Uh, I think in this context of um, all these uh, political uh, issues, um, I, I thought about uh, L'Arbre à l'Arbre in uh, Africa, which is also a place for wisdom and for um, not only for gathering, but also it's like a local parliament. It's a kind of place where uh, good decisions are taken. And uh, so it's, um, it, this has a political root too. Uh, and the environment um, uh, is always a, a kind of asymmetrical space because people are sitting uh, uh, in one side and not on the other side. So it gives to the space a kind of, uh, um, in Europe we have this sacred sense but uh, maybe in Africa we have the kind of a wisdom sense of space. Thank you. A little bit. Is it stable? Of course. Yeah. But there might be a response. Yeah. Francis. No, me. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's good. Good to talk about Africa in a positive way. I like that. So, good. Can I can I mention something? And I just remembered. So I grew up in Buenos Aires in Argentina, where we at one point had a terrible crisis, where people were just owners left their factories because it was it was hopeless. It was absolutely I've never seen anything like it. And what happened there? Because also in Latin America we have a kind of connective tissue. Uh, they went into those abandoned factories started working them, but they were 24-hour operations and they made room for the community. So yeah. people cooked collectively, people taught each other whatever they, you know, it was an amazing event and that went on, you know, for a few years actually. And again, this was a crisis, this was not your typical modern crisis, this was a devastating crisis. So that is also interesting that the factory became a place Mm -hmm. where people would go to teach music, they could yeah. play the guitar yeah. to another one, and it was also a site of production. You know, I thought that was actually a very nice concept that, that uh, should be maintained, but of course, as soon as the success began again, they were all privatized, so... Bad ending. We've got two questions here, one in the second row and one in the third row. Um, thank you all for a wonderful and inspiring evening. Um, I've had a few thoughts with regards to, especially the conversation with which Saskia brought up um, around the financialization of urban space and the fact that we're sitting in this pavilion, which has been so graciously funded by Goldman Sachs. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Yes, I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are for um, these beautiful trees that we're building, and if they're planted with seeds that maybe have financial poison in them, can they survive? Can they live? Can they keep growing? Um, is there... Did yeah. I put it on its head? I do have a mic. Ah, a there we go. Um, okay, I'll, maybe I'll start over. Um, yeah. With Goldman Sachs contributing and funding projects like this, do you think that public space and the trees that we're planting have the possibility to thrive and actually be these community spaces? Do you think it's problematic? Or do you see it as a gift to actually build something better from perhaps an industry that has um, yeah. diminished the city in ways that can't really be spoken. Yeah. Right, right. Well, there is one very practical, the Dutch side mm -hmm. of me, as mm -hmm. opposed to the Latin American mm -hmm. side, says, well, you know, they do less damage if they give the money to do this than if they use it for who knows what. Number two, there is a law. The law, the reason they do is not just because they, they have to. The part of their money, they have to give it away. But ultimately, the, what I am a critic of is the financializing capability, which is truly, for instance, 
uh, the traditional bank would not know what to do with the trillion dollar debt that students now have in the United sí. States. Finance says, a trillion dollars, whether it's debt or not, I can work with that. See, there, it's this capability. So the question then becomes, uh, if part of the money that they donate can be actually related to, okay, we are extracting a good for us from an institution that we might still be critics of. You know, I mean, I think we are, there are limit, limits, if you want, to how we can escape. If you look at all that has been financialized, I mean, it's a horror. So, so I, I think that, look, if the money can be materialized into something that is positive, public housing, etc., I'm fine. What I don't want then is to say, oh, they have become nice. But you, of course, and I don't want to tell the serpent what they have to do, you know, but you know what I mean? We, we, we should also be practical about it. If good things can be, if that's a good use of the money rather than more financializing, that's a very practical way that has problems, by the way, but I'll leave it at that. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think you should also, you know, emphasize the importance of, um, of free admission. I think, you know, very often I if you go, you very often if you go, you know, to cities, uh, and, and I think that is something to be defended at all costs, which is the free admission of public institutions you know, in, in London. Uh, we go to many other cities, the admission to institutions is 10, 20, 30 pounds. Uh, and that in a you know, society of inequality is, um, uh, is usually problematic. Um, and the other day, you know, somebody told me that actually um, they have nothing to do with the world of art or architecture, you know, in a completely different field and that uh, they would never go to a museum, uh, uh, he told me, and he said his daughter ran on a walk on a Sunday into the pavilion and now wants to become an architect, you know, 15 years old. And this can only happen if we remove yeah. thresholds. And I really believe in this idea. It's also got to do with the unpredictability that we can encounter art or architecture without having to buy a ticket. And you know, this pavilion uh, sits in the center of Kensington Garden and this is accessible as the park, which means yeah. hundreds of thousands of people visit it, visit, you know, by as many people as the architecture biennale in Venice. It's the, one of the most visited architecture events in the world. And you know, Sponsorship makes that possible. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions? Yeah, we have questions okay. first. I have a question to the panel. I guess you are all coming from the architectural background. The question is, are you ready for the next era <laughs> where we distinguish between, or not distinguish, we diminish the boundaries between the architects, city planners, engineers, transportation people, environmental people. I am a civil engineer. I'm a professor at the College, just next door. I live over there. I walk through this area for 20 years. Do you know that London, every 10 years, loses two and a half high parks, green spaces? Every 10 years, two and a half high parks are gone. Next 10 years, another two and a half. For five. buildings? We, I, I, I did know this event. I've just passed by. We're very happy that I'm here. Open house. Open conference. house. <laughs> I'm coordinating a big European project called Blue Green Dream. How the city's dream is not dream. You wake up, it's gone. It's the vision how we should build the cities for the next 50, 100, 200 years. And I'm so happy with this pavilion. I've seen the, this all these last years. I like this one much better. It's simpler, but has multifunctionality. <laughs> and I was very happy to, to be told that it collects rain. I am water engineer. It does not, our trees should not be done. I liked Stefanos Bosco Vertical and his projects in China. But multidisciplinarity, trees are not just trees. Trees collect water, trees reduce flood, trees reduce noise, air pollution, reduce the energy, improve energy efficiency. 38 different functions which we should not just plant trees. Trees should be selected and plant selective, and they have this multi So multifunction in architecture and spatial design in all the other. We are now bound to work together, all of us, architects, spatial planners, transportation, environment engineers together, and we have the methodology. I would be very much happy to talk to you. I was very much encouraged by this question. Do we, what is the difference between village and urban areas? Well, we all come, human civilization comes to village. We have not learned, we are yet to learn that 
we should not aim at protecting nature. We should bring nature to protect us. And it can be done extremely powerful way, extremely financial, effective way. And that is how nature, what we find on our roofs, what we find on the ground, on the ground, bring us together. We can bring, build our houses 20, 30, 40, 50 percent cheaper and is much in a better environment in healthier, greener, nicer. And I would very much, I'm very much encouraged what I heard tonight. But this is the beginning of the new era in urban design. We have to bring nature and build our cities to be nature friendly and to, to and I'm and my question is, are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I can start. Uh, I completely agree, and I am at a university where I can work with people from material science, from biology. You know, there is a select group within each of those disciplines that are obsessing about how to bring in the bacteria, the algae, the mushrooms, we all know about that, and all kinds of other modes. That means that every surface is doing at least two things. One is whatever the function, and the other one is working with the environmental question, right? So I think of every building, and I'm, an image that I have going with, it, with an airplane over a city, where all concrete surfaces, whether this way, that way, whatever, have been covered, you know, this bacterium that begins to seal off and eventually purifies the air right around every surface. Imagine from an airplane you would see the little islands of purified air wherever there is concrete, whereas now it's a negative. Now that doesn't solve the whole problem. That's just one example. If I had two hours, I would give you a long list, but I completely, completely agree with the point that you made. <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I will use a word of hands to say it's really, really urgent. It's urgent to work together. And here in our little s s scale, we did it. Uh, we work it with uh, engineer, and even we benefit from the experience of the serpentine people. Uh, we was we built a community, really. Even the builder was like part of it, and we have been traveling back and forward, um, so to Yorkshire to, to see how we can use the material in the best way. Uh, I mean, it's an example. We use wood, uh, you know, it's a tree. It's, it's it's growing, and I have to honestly say, I'm really happy that our our inspiration push it to really think about the nature. So yeah. it should be like this. And we are ready, really ready. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we can take one more question. There's a question here in the third row. Yeah. I, I think we have criticized a lot of London today, but actually I really like the city. Um, maybe now because, I, because I'm living, I'm even more in love. Um, I, I really, I'm a bit, I'm very critical, but at the same time, I think this city actually have amazing open spaces. And it's one of the cities yes. around the world that have more parks in the city center, and Indeed. where you, you don't have gate communities. I am working in a project in central London. I remember the client was American, and he wanted to create a gate community <laughs> completely closed. And the first thing that everyone told him is like, this is Europe. We don't close the, the courtyard. We don't close the, the public space. This has to be public, and everyone is welcome to come in this area, even if it's a posh building. And I think that capacity of UK to have social housing in the same neighborhood of yeah. rich people is amazing. And yes. you don't have that in Paris. And that's why there are a lot of issues in other cities that you don't have here. So I just wanted to say that actually I think London is, is great for many things. Of course, there is a lot of pressure financially, and there are a lot of things to, crit to crit criticize, but it still is, I think it's an example of urban design, um, gate, uh, taking people together from different environments and from around the world and being together in a place where everything is actually possible. She loves London, me too. <laughs> <laughs> One of our panelists wants to respond? Or? No, she loves London, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So I've got a very last question uh, to Francis, because actually I see many young architects here in the audience. And uh, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this lovely little book, which is an advice to a, to a young poet. Uh, Francis already kind of gave the advice to the young architect. And I kind of 
fully subscribe to this idea of just do it. But I wanted to ask Francis, says a little bit more, what would in 2017 be your advice to a young architect? Hmm. 2017. Everything is possible, if even Brexit is reversible. 